and welcome. It's so lovely to see people in the flesh as well as obviously online. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. So welcome to Good Grief Festival. My name's um, Lucy Salmon. I'm Associate Professor at the University of Bristol and I'm the founder of Good Grief Festival. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this in-person event on hope and meaning with David Kessler, who's here all the way from California, and my colleague, Liesl Dawson, and I'll be introducing them in a second. So first of all, I'm sure everyone here in this room knows that bereavement can shatter the landscape of a life in unimaginable ways. Finding hope and meaning in this ever-changed landscape is one of the challenges of grief that many of us face and it's the topic of this evening's event and I'd like to introduce our speakers now. We're obviously delighted to be joined um, by David Kessler um, in the flesh. We have welcomed him to Good Grief uh, online before but it's so nice to be able to meet him in person. So David is a grief specialist, an author, a public speaker and a bereaved parent. He facilitates online groups for those experiencing grief as well as leading one of the most respected online grief certificate programs. And those of you here in person can find a leaflet about this um, in front of you. He also hosts a podcast, Healing with David Kessler, and he's written several influential books, including the classic On Grief and Grieving with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and the bestseller You Can Heal Your Heart, Finding Peace After a Breakup, Divorce and Death with Louise Hay. His latest book, Finding Meaning, The Sixth Stage of Grief, journeys beyond the classic five stages to discover a sixth stage meaning. And joining him today in conversation is Dr. Liesl Dawson, who's Associate Professor in Literature and Culture at the University of Bristol, specialising in grief, Renaissance literature, and the history of the emotions. And she's leading a research project on creative grieving and writing a book on this subject. And she's also the Arts and Culture Lead for Good Grief Festival. Later on, um, after um, we've heard Liesl and David in conversation, we will be taking questions. Um, we've already requested questions from the online audience, but if you're here in person, please keep a track of your questions and you'll have a chance to answer, uh, ask those later on. So without further ado, I'll hand over to David and Liesl. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for starting this. I mean, it's amazing. I don't know if you think about what it starts to take in, to start an organization. So thank you for really doing this. And like it's just becoming so widely known and respected, so thank you. Oh, no small you. feet. No, no, no small feet. feet. Well, it is absolutely wonderful to have you here today, fellow Californian. I've gotten to see I brought you. the weather with me. It's like been <laughs> raining and gloomy know, in Los Angeles. it's actually so. sunny. And I've been, know, I've been a bring... real admirer of your work for many years. And I've also really admired the way you speak to grieving people with such love and compassion and understanding. So it's great Thank having you. you here. I wanted to start by asking you some questions myself. We also then have quite a long list of questions from our online audience. So I'm going to- Hi, online folks. <laughs> I know they're there somewhere yes, I can feel them. Yes. So used to online now. I know. So I'll move to those um, after I ask a few questions myself. And then we'll also take questions from the in-person audience. So my first question is about- Do we have, is there a little ring in here or is that just me? I don't know if we need to turn things down or it's a little twang. Evan? I get used to this being sound. Yeah, no, okay. Let's see if that's better. It's me? It, I think it's your sound. It's my sound. It? But it's fixed it, now. It's, the it's no, fixed it's now. The noise, it's okay, it's the noisy Californian. Um, no, 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 it's, uh, it's not you. <laughs> Good. So I wanted to ask you about your book, Finding Meaning, The Sixth Stage of Grief. I know that this was written after the death of your son. And I wondered if you would talk a little bit about your story, what happened, and also writing the book, what the book's about. Sure. As you said, my I've been a grief specialist for years, was doing this and, uh, you know, sat at the feet of so many people who had dealt with the worst tragedies. And not that I think anyone in grief assumes we know what it's like, but when my younger son David died, it was unexpected. The pain was so much more intense than I ever imagined. Not that I would, you know, you just think that's just a horrific pain, 
but it was excruciating. And I wanted to write a note to everyone I had counseled saying, I didn't realize how bad the pain was or I had forgotten or didn't get it because it, you know, just is part of your being at that point. Uh, I also, I did kind of wonder, like, I hope everything I've been teaching is true. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I'd experienced as a grief specialist for years is sometimes I would say something and a bereaved parent would say, yeah, but you haven't lost a child. And I always said, no, I haven't, and I have to defer to you. So I was a little curious. At some point, I thought, I hope what I've been teaching is helpful, and I hope I don't find out it's not helpful. So there was a part of me as I was going and continue to go through the experience that thought, oh, yeah, no, I'm in denial. I can't believe he's gone. I'm angry. Bargaining the what ifs, if onlys, certainly anger. And, you know, and for years with Kubler Ross, we always talked about the stages aren't linear, you don't have to follow them, all that stuff that hopefully you know by now. But um, I, I remember the idea of acceptance. Like, I don't want to just accept this and just stop there. It just can't end with acceptance. And so I began thinking about where do I go once I began to dance with acceptance? And it made me think of meaning in Viktor Frankl's work, Man's Search for Meaning. And I started talking to people who had gone through horrific events and wanted to understand how meaning might be a cushion. And not that it can take the pain away, but a cushion. And I always say to people, one of the first thing I, I learned and asked about to people who said they found meaning was, meaning is not in the horrible death. Meaning is in us. It's what we do after the death. So those were big things that came out of it for me. And I had to do all the things I told everyone else to do. I had to go to grief counseling. I sat down with a grief counselor. First thing I said to her is, I feel like I'm in the wrong chair. And she said, you must feel that way. And I went to grief groups and you know, I can't tell you. I used to say to people, go to grief groups and I would like say that like, pass me the coffee. And when I had to go to a grief group, the energy it took to show up. Now, when people come to groups, I like want to applaud because I get it's really hard to show up for ourselves and for our grief. Mm -hmm. So those were some big takeaways that led to the book. A, l a lot of people do find the idea of meaning, and making meaning difficult. Could you just say a little bit more about what you mean by this? What does meaning making look like? What kind of forms sure. might it take? And that's the challenge of writing a book called Finding Meaning, because I can't tell you how many times people say, oh, yeah, I saw your book, not there yet. Maybe someday I'll get it. I'm still like in pain. And I don't never know how to say to them, oh, it's about excavating the pain. It's that's to me, you don't find meaning you kind of excavate the pain and meaning is underneath. So I think when we often think of meaning, we think of the person who started the charity or the foundation, and we forget that meaning is in moments. Like tonight, just I've chatted with some people already that have been in my online groups. Oh my gosh, it's so meaningful. I like know some of their loved ones just by hearing about them. That brings meaning to me and I hope to them. So I think it's important to think about meaning in just little moments. And just, you know, the example I give is someone's dad put himself through medical school by being a waiter and like he was always so grateful when he got good tips. 
and their dad went on to be this amazing doctor. And then when he died, they shared with me that now whenever they go to a restaurant, they leave a big tip in honor of their dad. Just these little gestures that are meaningful is so, what I mean by meaning. So meaning might also be ways that we incorporate the per person who's died into our lives. So There's an integration. Yeah, yeah. And I always say, and I've heard this over the years, there's a part of me that died with my loved one. And I say, yes, and there's a part of your loved one that lives on in you. How are you nurturing that part of them? Like the person with the tip, they are holding their dad's generosity and they're nurturing it by bringing it into real life. So whatever your parent was, your spouse was, your child was, your sibling, what can we do by those parts that have been left behind in us to nurture them and grow them? Mm -hmm. That's lovely. Um, you write that... I like when she likes the answer. Yeah, no, it's good. <laughs> That's lovely. Thank you. You write, you write that death ends a life, but not our relationship, our love, our hope. But many people find it difficult to feel any hope whatsoever when they are grieving. And I just wonder what you'd say to them. Sure. There's a few things to say about that. I respect... You know, there's so many amazing people in this field, and I always sort of, I don't like saying anything about someone else's quote, but there's a quote out there, you may have heard it, that says, um, grief is love with nowhere to go. And I get in the pain why, why we would feel that, but I actually don't think it's true. When my son died or my parents died, I didn't stop loving them. I didn't stop loving my son. I love him to this day. And I think they still love us. So I always say, don't give death any more power than it already has. It can end a physical life, but not our relationship with them, not our love. And that's, I think, a helpful statement a little later. But early on, you're just in enormous pain. And when anyone talks about hope and healing and you're just, you can't get a sentence out, I think it's hard to take that in. So when someone says there's no hope, there's no healing, I might say, I completely get why you would feel that way and I see your pain. And until you can see the hope, I'm going to hold it for you. I hold hope for you. So I think we're here to sort of hold hope for one another. That's kind of what I would say to them. And I, it's now become a, a meme and a graphic and all that. Years ago, I broke my ribs and I said, having a broken rib is like grief. You look fine on the outside and yet every breath hurts. And so I think people don't understand if we look okay, it's still grueling inside. Mm -hmm. that, that leads me to another question. We often hear from people who are grieving that their friends or acquaintances don't want to talk to them about their grief. They don't mention the name of the person who's died. They minimize it or sidestep it with platitudes. And I just wonder why you think this is the case. And is there anything people can do to, to try to signal that need for their grief to be seen and witnessed and supported? I think it's a grief illiterate world. I don't think we know how to talk about it. And I think it's so important. And I hate that when you're in grief, I have to say, you might have to be the teachers of your friends. And you're gonna find some of your friends with instructions can show up well and for some it might make them just too uncomfortable and i so for the first group i will often talk about a direct ask to say i need to talk about my son and next month is his birthday and it's this date please call me on that day please check in a direct ask to say what you need 
don't hope they remember because they don't. For the people who don't get it, no matter how many times I say I need to talk about my son, just can you move on? Can you get over it? And I always say, no, my son isn't like a cold I'm trying to get over and recover from. Um, I'm never leaving him behind. Sometimes for those people, I see people continuing to try to get them to get it. And I always say, you'll never find milk in the aisle of a hardware store, no matter how much you look. So you just got to go, they're not the grief literate ones, you are, I'm going to talk to you. And the other thing is, that's why groups are important. Mm -hmm. Because grief is such a strange world that we find out, you know, everyone says, my best friend is going to get it. And then they don't. My spouse is going to get it. And then they don't get it. And you find that in grief, family and friends are like strangers. And strangers can become like family and friends. There's people here from my Tender Hearts group online that like literally have met in all different places of the world and have known each other online for months and get together and like, we started tonight by going, we know each other. So it's amazing Absolutely. to sort of get that concept. Absolutely. And not look for it where it's not. Yeah. yeah. You've done quite a lot of work recently, I've noticed, on trauma and grief, including a course I saw that you, you offered. Could you say a bit about the relationship between trauma and grief? Sure. I believe that all grief does not have trauma. So people can die, it can be really hard, it can be heartbreaking, it can be sad, but it's not traumatic. And then there's a couple other situations, there's times they can have a death that was sad, but we have old trauma from our childhood and we project it onto the current death and it becomes this trauma and grief mix. So the example I give of that is, my mother died when I was young, it's why I'm in this work. For years, I had huge abandonment around that. And so then whenever I dealt with any kind of loss, it was never just the loss, it was all the abandonment that I brought to it, all the old trauma. So it was always loss and trauma. And then the other thing that happens is our loved ones die in traumatic ways. And the confusing thing about trauma is your parent can be dying with your four siblings there, and it's traumatic for you, but not for them. So no one can say that death was traumatizing. Maybe, maybe not. It depends on me. So it's an interesting way, and I think people need to know a little bit about the trauma and the grief because many times when someone's really challenged and can't find some healing, it may be old trauma. Yeah. And I always remind people like with the word healed, I don't ever use the word healed. I've never been healed. I'm always healing. And sometimes when people have a lot of trauma, they'll go, don't even say that word. There's no healing. And I'm like, there's no healing? No. And I'm like, okay. That's sometimes old trauma. Mm -hmm. Now, early on, we all feel that way. Yeah. But later on, it might be signs of trauma. David, I'm interested to hear a bit more about your online group and some of your new initiatives. Sure. And what's in the leaflet. Could yeah, I brought those for you. This? So those are for helpers and for people who are in grief. I have two programs that I... I uh, do a lot. One is Tender Hearts. That's an online grief program. Some of you are from Tender Hearts here. And people think when they hear online grief group or program, they think it's six of us online. It's actually hundreds of people. And what I love about it that was so surprising is that we find ourselves in each other's stories. And we find our healing in each other. Like, you know, if I'm with someone one-on-one -on -one and you tell me you're feeling guilty and I explain that the fact that you went to lunch 
isn't the reason your loved one died and don't feel guilty about it. You may be like, yes, but, yes, but, and you'll fight back on it. When you see someone else who's got the same loss as you blaming themselves for going to lunch, you're like, I can't believe she's doing that to her. Oh, me too. Me too. Gosh, if she's not guilty, then I guess I might not be either. So it's lovely to see that. And we have what's called Monday specific losses. And we were on 25 simultaneous groups, death of a child, death of a sibling, death of a parent, a father, a mother, uh, death of a child by their ages, death by addiction, fentanyl uh, poisoning, death by suicide, a faith group, an afterlife. Amazing that they all happen at once. Then Wednesday and Thursday, people come on and have a conversation with me. And then Friday, we take on a topic like prolonged grief diagnosis or guilt or fear or whatever it may be, magical thinking. So that's Tender Hearts Group. For those of you watching, you can find out information at Tender Hearts Support, hearts with a plural, and support, Tender Hearts Support. And then the other, I have graduates here of the Grief Educator Program. That's a program to many clinicians realize they didn't get enough grief training, if any, um, so we have therapists, nurses, clergy, first responders, and we also have coaches, and we also have people who experienced grief that want to turn their pain into purpose and learn more. It's a big three-month program. We have another starting in April, so you can find out about that at grief-educator.com. I, I'm just amazed at how well online works. Mm. You know, it's, it's more intimate than you think it's going to be. It's more think, intimate. Yeah. Like, I know these folks. Yeah. We know each other. Oh, absolutely. You know, they're like, you got your hair cut. And I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think there might be some pieces of paper coming around as well. Oh, yeah, so we're going to pass can, papers yeah. around. By the way, because I'm going to, I know one thing we can't get into tonight is the whole prolonged grief diagnosis and now people being labeled prolonged grief, which I think sounds like, you're grieving too long, so I don't like that. Um, and I'm a big believer, I want professionals to get paid for helping people in grief, and I want people in grief to have their insurance and others pay for their services. But in the US, we've made it that if you're experiencing these symptoms one year and a day, if I'm still sad and yearning about my son a year and a day, I have prolonged grief. So we don't have time to get into all that, but I'm going to send you a video about it if you want. They're going to pass around a sheet, or if you want easier, and for those of you online, just right now if you want to send an email to info, I-N-F-O, at grief.com, and just put Bristol in there, and I'll send you that video and a self-care video and some other helpful things. So. Lovely. That's, That's my way to keep in touch with folks. Absolutely. And they're going to pass those things around if they want to pass the clipboards around. That'd be great. So I'm now going to turn to some of the questions that came in from our online audience. Um, I'm going to start with a question from Carol. Hi, my, Carol. Online. Hi, Carol. My husband died at the age of 50 as a result of his addiction to alcohol. I lived in hope that one day he would acknowledge his addiction, get help, and maybe recover. That hope died when he did. How do I find hope for myself now that I've lost the love of my life? I also feel that I've lost so much of my identity. Okay, there's a lot in that question. There's a lot, yeah. There's a lot. So our way of thinking about addiction has changed dramatically. We're understanding more about the science of it and realizing that we have illnesses in our mind. We had a, a, a first lady years ago who said, just say no to drugs, like it would be that simple. We also have drugs now that have been engineered, engineered to be extremely addictive. And so the idea of, oh, it's a choice, isn't the model we're using anymore. It's more that it's this illness of the mind. Now, not the same, 
but a understandable physical illness model, look at cancer. There's different degrees of cancer. I had a skin cancer, it was easily treatable. There's other people who have aggressive cancers that are hard to treat and they die from them. We can sort of tell with staging and types of cancer how lethal someone's cancer is. Addiction, illness of the mind, self-harming thoughts, you can't look and go, oh, they've got an easily treatable case of addiction. They've got an easily treatable case of mental illness. Theirs is going to be lethal. You sort of can't tell that. And here's one of the things that I think is our challenge. We all know the language of prevention. We can prevent this. We can prevent that. In this room, in this context, we're talking about postvention. The person has died. There's a different language from postvention. You know, when we talk about, for instance, um, death by suicide, we always want to talk about you must do everything you can to prevent a death by suicide. Of course, we want to do that. And we don't want to say, despite your best efforts, it might not do any good on that particular person. Because we don't know who that person that we can help and who's got such an aggressive one that we can't. So we say, prevent everything. Many of you have had loved ones die from addiction, self-harming thoughts, illness of the mind, and you know it just wasn't preventable despite their best efforts and despite your best efforts. So that's why we're talking about post yeah. So to this person, it might have not been within your husband to really get that this is an illness. His mind was at the effect of it. So I would say that piece, and in terms, you know, not my place to say whether someone's the love of your life. Um, I assume he certainly was. And his story is over and yours continues. So think, be yeah. curious about your own yeah. story. I'm really struck by that sense of the way that when you lose someone you love, they take not just themselves, but they also take the version of you that they hold. And so, so you lose that as well. And I think one of the things I would say to Carol as well is for her to try to find connections with people who could give her back some of those parts of herself. Right. You know, and, and it, it won't be exactly the same. But also if people can listen to her talk about that relationship, she might also find a way to recover some of those parts of her, because I think that's one of the things that's so devastating. You and know? it's such a good point you're making, because people get stuck like where they'll go, I want the old you back. And we'll go, well, the old me isn't here anymore. I am a different version. But there is parts of ourselves that still need expressing. Yeah. The other thing that's interesting about that is she said, I think something about taking her identity. And there is true, you had your identity with them. I would also say to her, there's an identity of just you. You might have gotten to a midlife crisis and been working on anyway. We all, part of our work is to discover us, discover just who we are too. Good question. No, it's, it's very good question. Um, okay, we have this question from Karen. I keep revisiting memories of my son's death whenever I try to go to sleep. This stops me from sleeping and makes going to bed really awful. What can I do to stop this pattern? I often think one of the first questions I ask people is, how long ago did your loved one die? I don't think she said that, no, did she? No. So obviously, early on, you're not supposed to have a good night's sleep when your loved one dies. It is supposed to keep you awake. And I actually think of when people ask me what's early grief, like if I just asked the average person out there, what's early grief? They'd go first month, first year. I think early grief is the first two years, the first two years. So 
depending on where she is. If she's early on, of course it's keeping you awake. If she was to tell me it's two, three years down the road, I would go, your grief's not going to be over. But is it keeping you awake because it's asking for your attention? One of the things in Finding Meaning, the last book, I studied buffaloes. I never thought I'd study buffaloes. Buffaloes, when they sense a storm coming, actually run into the storm, thereby minimizing the time they're in the storm. We, on the other hand, want to keep grief three feet behind us. You know, and it's a hard pain. You probably don't want to think about your son's death during the day or your spouse's death or your parents' death. So you probably push it down all day and guess when it gets the best of you? Late at night. Yeah. Yeah, you, I almost wonder if, if she allowed herself to think about the death in the morning. Right. If she actually said, I'm going to give you know, an hour in the morning to think about the death. That it wouldn't sort of then emerge right. in the evening. That, that maybe she's pushing it down and it kind of... And I always think again. about grief doesn't need a lot of time, but it needs dedicated time. Yeah. So the idea of giving it some dedicated time early on instead of like just when you're going to bed. Good question. And happens to all of us, a lot of us. So we have an anonymous question. Okay. We have two girls and lost our eldest, age 34, in November 2020 nine hours after giving birth to her first baby and our first grandchild. We're stuck. The pain is awful. And our morning seems so confused with a baby who is a joy to help take care of. But we can't feel joy in any of it. Any advice? Yeah, it's, it's also tough about not knowing how long ago, but just a horrific situation. Mm -hmm. Just horrific. Of course, it would have to be just... A 30, 34 year old mm -hmm. child dying, brutal, and them having a baby. I mean, how do you deal with joy and excruciating pain mm -hmm. in one? So tough. One of the things I would say later on down the road that I've seen is to be really careful for that child to allow that child to grow up with its own identity and joy. And what I mean by that is I've seen situations like that where the mom has died, the father's died, the child gets an A, and instead of going, congratulations on your good grade, we go, oh, your mom's not here to see it. How, and like, there can be no good for that child. There, it's just all this shadow of grief. So. You want to make sure it's amazing what the child does and tell the child about their amazing mother to remind them. And not to feel guilty if you have moments of happiness. Absolutely. You know, I get a sense right. from that as right. well, that yes. there's almost an anxiety about taking joy in the child. We have and a I, disloyalty, exactly. like we think it's disloyal to be still happy about yeah. a baby. Yeah, but kind of giving time to the grief, but also allowing yourself to really, if, if you can, delight. In Where that. do you think that disloyalty comes from? The, the anxiety about it. I think, yeah. I think Or that we even make up that story that it is disloyal. I'm disloyal to have happiness ever again. Yeah. Well, the sense that they should be constantly present and that the present the presence initially manifests itself in the pain. Um, I think that might be it. Yeah. Do you have? You know, I don't. The, the only thing I think about in our modern world is, you know, you used to wear black mm -hmm. for a year. And I don't think like there's a magical thing about your griefs over in a year. I don't think that's true. But one of the things the clergy would often do at the year point is say, you now have permission to live again. You don't have to take off your black. You can keep wearing it, but you have permission to live again. I don't think we have a moment that we know, oh, it's okay to be bringing life yeah. into yeah. the darkness. I often say to friends who've been bereaved, if you feel happy, feel happy. Don't worry. 
the grief will still be there. Right. It's coming back. It's, it's coming waiting back. for you. And you'll turn the corner or hear a song and it's right. back again. It's coming back. So if you get a little break or a moment of forgetting, take it, take it while you have it and it will yeah. give you strength for the moments when it all comes back again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Let me ask you another question. So, David, I'm listening to Finding Meaning and Finding and find the chapters on mental health, suicide, and more love than pain really helpful. I can relate so much to what you say about your son. What I'm finding particularly difficult in my grief is the pain I feel around my child's life and the pain he lived with, and also anger about how he was not cared for by mental health services when he reached out for help. Maddie took his life last November on hospital premises after being told he would be discharged. Do you have any words of wisdom to help me navigate this? So I think a lot of anger, right. frustration. So one of the things I invite people to think about is even changing our language a little from he took his life to the illness took his life. Because there is this part of him that was amazing and loving and was not filled with that self-harming illness to sort of recognize that part of us. And I think the feelings of anger at a system that doesn't do well with mental illness. I mean, ours isn't, mm -hmm. we're trying to always make it better mm -hmm. and there's amazing dedicated people and it's not what we need or want it to be. So I do think we don't know how to do it really well yet and we're striving but not there so I can see how you would feel that way and to sort of allow that and validate that yeah no that's interesting um, is it okay this is an anonymous question to tell yourself that your loved one is on vacation or a business trip in order to come back to grieving later so almost give yourself permission to pretend someone's not dead. I have it never had that question before. <laughs> I have never had that question. I love a new question. So my first reaction was going to be no. Like, no, don't tell yourself that. I'm just, I'm never a believer in saying something that's not true. On the other hand, as I heard it, I thought about that's how denial works. That we can't take in all the pain at once. So we take a break from the pain. So there's a part of me that goes, I guess if the pain is too intense and you need a little break, but I would actually advise that person to tell the truth. I need a break from the pain rather than they're on vacation. I need a break from the pain. I'm going to distract myself. Because I think saying something that's not true isn't helpful. What yeah. do you think about that? Yeah, I don't know. I, I guess I feel like if you're really doing it deliberately, if you can turn it on and turn it off again, it's an interesting thought experiment. And I almost right. wonder, I suppose, what I would be, I, what I would almost suggest is doing something even more alternative, like writing a story, doing a kind of fictional thing. Um, where you get to meet the person again or say what you want to say or work out some of what's behind that. I don't know. Like, I guess in sort of drama therapy, you often play different roles. You play with fictional modes. Yeah. You, you play with the as if. Right. And I guess, I guess I'd be interested in just experimenting with that. Right and seeing what happens. I'll tell you something we did with that. And first of all, it makes me think about, um, you know, I think there is a part of our mind that goes, oh, I forget, especially if they didn't live right there with you, like, oh, I forget, mm -hmm. they're not coming back. Yeah. Like any day they should walk through the door. So it's not unusual to have that feeling. But one of the things we did on our Tender Hearts group that I think was a little out there and I would not have done this if my own son hadn't died. I said to someone, if David was alive today and I began just having magical thinking about 
who my son would be today and what he would be like if he had lived. And everyone I said it to was like, don't do that. And I went, okay. And I found I just did it in my head without anyone. Mm -hmm. And then one day in Tender Hearts on our Friday Focus, I said, to you, I don't know if it's just me, but like, what if we had a session where we all just shared who we think our loved one would be if like things had not gone horribly wrong and they were still alive and everyone was like, yes, we're in. And there was so much energy and just giving people permission to go, here's what they would be like, here's what they'd be doing. And it was just energizing. Mm. So it was amazing to let grief breathe in that way mm. with the magical thinking. That's really interesting. Um, I wonder if we should take some questions <gasps> from our in-person audience. Do you have a question? There's one. Yes. The all right. Oh, a few. Yeah. It's I good because I can ask questions back. Yeah, thanks very much, <laughs> both yes. of you. My name's Ian. Uh, amongst other things, I'm a humanist funeral celebrant. Um, I sometimes wonder if some of the pain and loss that we feel or associated with grief is in large part to do with the way a lot of Western culture, I think, tends to frame death as either being an absence of life or the opposite of life. And I think, you know, if you look at it as part of life or the completion of a life or a fulfillment of life, that just alters the whole scene. So I just wondered whether that's a th uh, theme in your thinking. And I can't tell you as much about what it's like here as I can in the U.S., but some things that came up for me during that question is in the U.S., if you live to 105 years old and your whole family's gathered around and you go, what a great life, and you die at 105, we still have to say on the death certificate, heart failure or respiratory failure. Like at 105, you still failed. <laughs> you still failed. Something in your body failed. There's no way we can write on a death certificate, great life, natural causes. No natural causes for us. I don't know what it's like here. And we don't have a lot of acceptance around there's a spring, there's a summer, there's a fall, and there's a winter to life. And that there's a time we're born and live and die. Not talking about sudden losses or tragic deaths, but for those people, we don't, we don't know how to not rage against the dying of the light. You know, even when I think about raging against the dying of the light, that was around blindness and not even death. So, but we do treat end of life as this failure. And I don't think, and even in the moments we could, just like you said, we know how to go, good life, great job, well done, strong finish, good for you. I don't know that, I don't know that we know how to say those things. It is, it's funny to hear them, right? When was the last time you heard someone go, finish well? <laughs> Should we get another question? Do you want to yes, over there. Yeah. Hang on, she's got a mic coming to you. Great question, and thank you for your work. Hi, I'm Sally, and a uh, retired nurse who spent many years with dying patients, um, sometimes young, and went through a process of helping them to write birthday cards, write letters to children for years to come. And I'm reflecting on what you were just saying about um, there is a danger that we burden those children. And subsequently, I trained as a grief support worker. And actually, one of the group had had that exact experience, being a mother. And she said, you have no idea how difficult it is finding the right moment in the day for them to open those cards. And I'd just be very interested to know your thoughts on those sorts of ideas that are still practiced in palliative care, I think, a lot. So the idea of cards and all that for children who the loved one has passed on. Yeah, I think for her particularly, she said, um, you know, the 18-year-old had her last card knowing that the 16-year-old had two more to come. Wow. You know. Yeah, that's really interesting. Well... It is another way. I mean, think about it. If you're like 
oh, this is my last card from my mom who died, you sort of like you feel another ending. And I think with everything it's mixed. I mean, wouldn't I love a card from some people who died? I would love a card that they happen to have written. And I could see like it could be challenging if I don't know when they're coming and when the last one is. So it would be a double edge. I could see that. Yeah, much more complex. One of the things that we've done, uh, and I've seen this in hospices, um, we have done it where maybe the uh, hospice worker sits down with the person who's dying and says, what would you like your family to know at one year? Could we jot it down in a letter? And then they mail it a year later. So I know they didn't know how that would go over, but families seem to have loved it. It's an interesting yeah, idea. Yeah, it is. Uh, other questions? Thank yes. Hi, David. I'm Ali. I work as a therapist. Um, a couple of uh, clients have said to me that they don't want to let go of their grief because it keeps them connected to the person that's died. And so as they kind of move uh, along the process, they don't, it's like they want to keep hold of it because they're scared that they're going to forget the person and the feelings keep them connected. I just wonder what, what you would say to someone that's, that's really scared to let go of that, that grief, the sort of natural process of it. We hear that a lot. We hear that a lot. And a few responses that I have to people is I always tell them, you know, when people ask, how long will I grieve? I always say, how long will the person be dead? Because if they're going to be dead for a long time, you're going to grieve for a long time. Now, when people hear that, they think I mean you're going to be in pain forever. And I tell people no feeling is final. The reality is, to me, the goal of the work we do is to eventually remember with more love than pain. My mother who died decades ago, it's all love now. It's all love. My son, I still got some pain there six years ago. I still have a little pain, but there's a lot of love there now, but it wasn't right away. So I think people don't know that grief is not just pain. It's also love. And when people go, but if I let go of the pain, I'll say to them, if you let go of the pain, when you're ready, in your own time, no rushing, you will be connected only in love. Wouldn't you love to be connected only in love? Like with my mom, it's just a love connection. Pain is gone, only love now. So to help them think about love as a connector, People who served in the, you know, in the wars and in the service, they'll go like, this pain is a badge of honor. I'll go, you know, love is a stronger badge, a stronger connector. That's great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your work. I wonder, too, about the kinds of active things that can be done to keep the memory, you know, that aren't necessarily about the grieving process, but maybe about making the favorite cake, going to places, you know, doing something that reminds you of that person. Seems like another way to keep them of with the you. Of love, yeah. yeah. And I think sometimes we go to the places that are the pain. Mm. And it's interesting to go to the places that might remind you of the love. Um, I have a question. I have a friend. He is grieving for over two years. He lost his partner through cancer. And I'm trying to help him, but he's drinking himself to death. And he's what? I drinking he's himself drinking to, to death. death with alcohol. And there's a picture on the desk and everything, and he can't feel any joy. I'm trying to help, but honestly, I'm kind of codependent already to help him, and it hurts me as well. How, how can I help him? Or to, how can I help him to get help? I, of course, start with, how can we help you first? 
how can we help you? And you would be the idea of how can you be less codependent? Because I'll tell you something, when I'm bringing someone down, it makes my world worse. Like one of the things we often do in codependency is if you're in your darkness, I think, okay, I'm going to join you. And we lose our sense of self. The more you can keep your sense of self, the more helpful you will be. The second thing, and this is, I want to make sure I say this right, and if I don't get this right, you can help me a little bit. The drinking is a way of numbing painful feelings. So to talk about, so many times we want to talk about, stop drinking, the drinking's not good, and we're not addressing the pain they're trying to escape from. And sometimes we can talk instead about, I see how much pain you're in. Could we talk about that? Could we talk about your loved one dying? Because if you can help give them healthy outlets to talk about their loved one, the hope is maybe they won't need the alcohol as much. What would you say about that? Is that yeah, sort of no, the same thing? Yeah, no, absolutely. That, that, you know, that the, the things that destroy one, it's not the pain of grief. It's the things you do to block the pain of grief. And I think that finding a way for this person to allow himself to be open to grief and to feel the sadness. But he, but yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so a couple things. Yeah. So she said, just for those of you listening, yeah. She said, I said, he can cry on my shoulder. Sometimes, like if we say, you can have those feelings, come have those feelings, it's different than going, tell me about your loved one who died. Tell me about what your day is like. Tell me how much you're missing them. Because like if someone says to me, you can come have your pain here. I don't know how to come have my pain here. But if you ask me about my son... I know how to answer that. So maybe ask him about his loved one. And I see how much you care and how much it's hurting you. So I just want to acknowledge that too and what a good friend he has. Thank you. Back there. Oh, and one there. Hi. Hello. Hello. Um, is that working? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Yes, um, it is. Okay. I'm Kate. I'm an academic. I'm asking this question as an academic. We did a study on direct cremations, which are just taking off here in the UK. That's not having a funeral after someone has died. And we, when we spoke to people, often it was because they, it was someone who had died from dementia or there'd been lots of goodbyes already, many, many over a period of time, a prolonged dwindling of dying over a period. And people spoke about their relief that the person had died, and they felt a release as well. And there were lots of conflicting emotions about how open they could be about that. And one of the reasons then for not having a funeral was, was because it was, it was easier not to have to actually say they were pleased that this person's life had ended. And I just wondered what your thoughts are on that, as there may be liberating elements of when someone has died and how to acknowledge them and validate, you know, because I'm hearing what a lot of your saying is about validation. It's about hearing people and uh, giving them opportunity, yeah, saying it, what, what, they're, what they're saying matters. Is that, what would you say to them? I thought you were going in a whole other direction. So in that direction, what I would say is I think you're absolutely right. I wrote about in one of the books the idea of relief and exactly how normal it is to feel relief after a long illness, after the medical equipment's gone, whatever that relief may be, because you're not glad they've died, you're glad the suffering is over, and when they suffer, you suffer. So absolutely, we want to normalize relief. I'm sorry they feel like they couldn't have a celebration of life, 
and sort of, do you have celebrations of life here? Yeah. You have those. You know, to sort of go, we're not going to grieve this person. We've spent years grieving them, but let's celebrate their life. The place I thought you were going to go at first is I have found, and this is not in a study, but completely anecdotal, is there's a lot of times before COVID, not with COVID, but before COVID, I would say to people, tell me about your loved one's funeral. And they would go, yeah, I'd never got to it. The timing was off. People couldn't travel. It was a bad time of year. Everyone was so busy. What'd you do? Oh, they're on my shelf. I'm trying to figure out what to do. I would feel like I would end up talking to more people who never had that bookmark, that ending, that ritual that said this life is complete. Now, COVID came along and made that impossible for a lot of people. But in general, I think those rituals help us so much. Mm -hmm. So I'm a big believer in having the ritual, whether it's relief or sadness or whatever it is. But thank you for that. It's really, I love that you're thinking about that and acknowledge We're that. nearly out of time. So maybe All right, time nearly out for, of time. Yeah, and I'm a question. long answer kind of guy. So. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. Hello, David. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I just, um, so my mother passed away three years ago. Uh, my dad recently passed away in November. And even though he was quite old, he was 89 years old, I am finding very difficult to, to process my, my grief. Um, I feel um, a strong feeling of anger, which sometimes I identify as almost ha like hatred, you know? I feel that I am easily irritated by everyone and by you're, almost You're everyone. irritated by everyone? Yes, thank you. So I, I just wanted to know how can we... And who died in your life? Mom, my mom, mom three years father. ago, and my father. And how was your relationship with them? Really, really close. Really close. Yes. So I just want to to ask you, um, how can we mm, manage this horrible feeling of anger? Because it's, sometimes I don't even feel that it's sadness anymore. It's a feeling, it's a very, very intense feeling, which is like preventing me from connecting. Mm. Um, and I, f I feel a sense of guilt as well, um, you know, in terms of, you know, how I relate with my friends and how I relate with my workmates as well. And Have your friends had the death of a parent or are you the only one? Uh, some of them have experienced that and some others, they haven't experienced that yet. Do you feel like your pain has been seen? Like people around you get it? I feel that some people get it and some people, I, I, my feeling is that they don't get it. Yes. I think last question, if you, if your anger could talk, what does your anger want you to know? Um, I, I guess it's just sadness. <laughs> it's interesting, I was gonna go there because I was gonna say, I always think of anger as pain's bodyguard. We have a pain inside of us. Most of us with that pain, express that pain as sadness. Some people like me express it as anger. It's the exact same pain. Some just go sadness, some go anger. So it is important exactly what you're doing to recognize this is pain. Maybe be around other people who felt about their parents the way you did. You know, because someone else can be grieving who like had a parent they didn't like, and you're like, why aren't we grieving the same? And well, because one liked a parent and the other one didn't. And, you know, we have to grieve the person we had. And sometimes we have to grieve the person we didn't have that we wish we would have had. Yeah, I think feelings of anger are so, so normal, so normal and natural. And actually, they're a reaction to the fact that what's happened to you is not fair, you know, and actually that's often the case when someone we love dies. They shouldn't have died. They should be here. Yeah. And you feel furious. And be, feeling furious seems to me a very rational, understandable reaction. The other thing I think some people do is they find an OK outlet for the anger. Right. So I know some people who run because it's a way of 
discharging it. I think anger is a kind of energy, and if you use that energy, you can kind of burn through it, and that adrenaline will kind of go, and then you'll be returned to the other feelings. But I think also just knowing that it wasn't fair. <laughs> and, yeah. like, and like, you know, I think you have every right to be mad. Like some people tonight were mentioning Paul Denniston, who does grief yoga. If you look up griefyoga.com, he's got anger exercises. Just because she said healthy ways to get it out. Now, sometimes people go, there are no healthy ways because anger was never modeled yeah. for them in a way that wasn't dangerous. And it's so common, like she said, it's even got its own stage. Yeah. So it's okay. There was a joke in there, but <laughs> anger, it's stage of anger anyway. Yeah, but I'm so sorry. Didn't get that one. With I'm very sorry. Thank you. And it's pain. It's pain. I think we are going to have to close yeah, this conversation. You. But it's been so, it's been amazing to be in a room with, with all of people, you. With people, with people. I often feel when we're doing the Zoom chat, I do feel a lot of love to the, the comments and the chat. And I get off the Zoom and I feel like I'm part of this amazing community. But it's so much more powerful to be in a room with humans that I can see your faces. Um, Do you know my fear? Can I just tell yes. you my fear? <laughs> my fear is there were so many times I even had like an all day class to teach. And I was like standing there looking at a camera all day. And I felt like someone was going to come in someday and go, okay, David, we're leaving. And I'm like, no, I'm teaching. And they're going to go, he thinks there's people in there. <laughs> It's all, we, we need to get you somewhere safe. So I'm like so glad there's real people. You're not just in my it's mind. Real people, real people, not just bots. If you need to find me, need some more support, please check out grief.com. If you want to get some of the videos I talked about that can help, just send us an email at info at grief.com and just put Bristol in the subject and I'm going to send you some helpful things. Can we have a clap for the wonderful, warm, lovely day? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for you. Great question. Thank you.